Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's MinMD Real Talk webinar, Injection Therapy Online Clinic. My name is Austin Hunt, and I'll be your moderator for this event. I work on the marketing team here at MinMD, and I'm excited to be hosting this session today. Before we get started, we have a short disclaimer that we need to review. The health and medical information provided during this webinar, as well as the questions and responses from the webinar providers, are solely for informational purposes. This content is not intended to take the place of advice or treatment from health professionals. Nothing presented in the webinar is intended to be used for medical evaluation, diagnosis, or treatment. It is not intended to substitute for your relationships with your own healthcare and pharmaceutical providers. Always seek the advice of your healthcare provider before beginning any new treatment or if you have questions regarding a medical condition. All right, with that being noted, I'm pleased to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Jonathan Balin. Dr. Balin is a urologist located in Clearwater, Florida, who specializes in erectile dysfunction, Peyronie's disease, low testosterone, and men's sexual health. Today is going to cover injection medication, syringe and dosing, injection techniques, support options, and then hold a live Q&A to close out the webinar. So, without any further ado, I'd like to kick things off by welcoming our presenter, Dr. Balin. Over to you. All right. Thanks very much, Austin. Uh, thank you, MedMD, for having me, and, and thank you to our listeners and viewers who are logging in. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to first share some poll questions with our uh, audience members. I believe we have four or five questions. Austin, if you can bring those up for us. Great. So first off, how long have you been on injection therapy as a treatment option? Or if you haven't been, uh, zero to five months, good answer. Let's go ahead and take a second to answer that real quick. All right, so we have a, a good mix here. It looks like uh, 42%, or the, which is the majority, have never been on uh, injection therapy or less than six months worth. Uh, and otherwise, it's a spectrum. Very good, let's go to the next. Okay, have you ever performed an injection on yourself and not received the desired, excuse me, the desired result? Very good. So a good almost three quarters men have at one point injected and not received the desired result. We will be talking about tips and tricks on proper dosing and proper administration of intracavenosal injections. And that's certainly one of the main goals of tonight. Next question. How many injections have you performed on yourself? Similar to how long have you been on injections? Okay, so we have a good number of, uh, of ICI veterans here. Um, and uh, actually a minority uh, have not, or have very few uh, injected in the past. So this is helpful to know. So we can talk to those who uh, are frequent users and those who are considering getting into the injection world. All right, and finally, have you attended any of our previous injection therapy clinics? Uh, I know Tom Sellers uh, has done one most recently. We have uh, Patrick, our pharmacist uh, consult, has done a great job with these in the past. Have you ever attended an ICI clinic uh, online? Excellent, so most of you have not. So, and those who have, welcome back. All right, so let me minimize this, and we're gonna get back to the PowerPoint slides. Let me put this back over here. So we have about 20 slides here. Oh, I have a slide on my office. So if you are in the greater Tampa SAP Clearwater area, uh, my practice Advanced Urology Institute has offices throughout the area, Palm Harbor, Bardmore, which is in Largo, and our main hub in Clearwater. Uh, my office phone number is here and we'd be happy to help uh, treat you and your erectile dysfunction. We have about 20 slides to go through and it's gonna begin with the erection process and end with the equipment used for intracavenosal injections. And again, the goal is to provide some background information about erections, about the medication, about administration. And then after we get through that, we will do a, a demonstration with some props and finally the Q&A, which is uh, likely the most popular portion of the procedure. So let's take a minute to talk about the erection process. So this is an uh, involuntary response to a voluntary act. So when you are aroused, nerves surrounding the penis become active. They release a neurotransmitter cascade including things like nitrous oxide, uh, cyclic GMP, cyclic AMP. All of these neurotransmitters work to relax the smooth muscle of the penis within the tissues called the corpocavernosum. 
These muscles relax. They uh, allow the corporate cavernosal artery to dilate, and this brings in more, uh, more blood to the penis. With more blood flow to the penis, uh, at the same time, you're constricting the veins and you're restricting the outflow of blood from the penis, and thus you receive rigidity. Blood is contained within a layer called the tunica albuginea, which is a fibrous layer that encapsulates the corporate cavernosal space. And this provides uh, that pressure and that turgid pressure of, of a nice firm erection. When uh, additional blood makes the penis hard and stiff, and then when it comes time to d 2 mess, the veins will allow the blood flow to egress, uh, that those uh, muscle fibers reverse their action of relaxation and you go back to a flaccid state. So let's dive right into intracavernosal injection therapy. So these are medications targeted at increasing the blood flow to the penis. And typically we talk about three mainstays of therapy, alprostadil, papaverin, and fentolamine. And Trimix is a mixture of all three of these drugs, whereas Bimix is only papaverin and fentolamine. And we'll go into a little bit more of each of these ingredients. So again, papaverin and fentolamine are, make up the Bimix formulations, and MenMD has multiple formulations of both Bimix and Trimix. And it's up to you and your treating physician to decide on which administrating dose and which administrating formulation to use when you're treating erectile dysfunction. Typically, uh, I like to start at a low dose Trimix for most of my patients, but this is very variable depending on the patient's history and uh, the cause of his erectile dysfunction. So as you can see, there are many formulations. Now you'll notice the difference on the right side of the slide here. There's a standard Trimix mix and a low dose alprostadil mix. Uh, you may have heard or even experienced the, the penile burning that may happen when you do intracavernosal injections. That is likely due to the alprostadil ingredient, and thus we have low alprostadil formulations. Based on the strength that you and your treatment physician think is necessary, we can tabulate and formulate your specific injection with these three ingredients. Now, typically there's a standard base of papaverin, which is 30 milligrams per milliliter of injection, and then you're gonna be alternating how much alprostadil and how much fentolamine to include. And uh, alprostadil, again, is the one that can cause that aching sensation, and that's what we'll try to uh, minimize if you're one of the men that experienced that side effect. So needle size is a big point of discussion. There are many different ways to do this, and uh, one of the things I try to have my guys not be scared of is the needle itself. It's an insulin needle. These are the smallest needles on the market, typically 29 or 31 gauge needle, uh, various lengths. But when we refer to the needle, we are referring to the length and thickness or gauge of the needle. When we refer to the syringe, that's the plastic portion of the needle, uh, that refers to how much volume you can hold in your uh, dose and in your injection. And certainly the plunger is part of the syringe, so that's what you'll be interacting with to, to inject. Now, when we talk about dosing, you may hear your physician talk in milliliters or cc's, cubic centimeters. Those are the same thing. And one cc uh, is one milliliter equals 100 units. So when, when I start patients on dosing, I'll commonly start them on 0.1 or 0.2 of a trimix solution. And so 0.2 milliliters is actually 20 units. So different nomenclature for all the, the same process. And we'll talk a little bit more about that during our uh, demonstration. So... How do you find the right dose? This is a, something I work very actively with my patients. You'll probably receive a test dose in the office, and you'll also receive education on how to administer the drug uh, on yourself, well, hopefully with your physician or a PA or, or an ARMP. And then you'll go home and be told to start here and see how you do. And so this is where uh, an erection journal comes in because we're aiming for an erection uh, over in this, you know, seven through nine category. If you were to score your maximum rigidity, uh, where a 10 is you were 21 years old and you had the best direction of your life, we're not necessarily shooting for that with this medication. We want to get to the seven to nine range where you have a nice firm erection. You absolutely can have satisfactory sex. You can please your partner and it doesn't last for too long because as, as you'll learn, the main side effect that physicians are worried about when they administer or, or uh, prescribe uh, intracavernosal injections is priapism or prolonged erection over four hours. That's actually a medical emergency. And if you do experience an erection lasting three and a half, four hours, you need to call your doctor's office or present to an urgent or emergent care and get that addressed. So the purpose of the uh, erection log is to log your progress. So if you try uh, a 0.1 or 0.2 milliliters on one night 
and you get a great response, then you can log that each time. Or how much do you increase or decrease by and what was the effect? How long did your erection last? And what was the rigidity on a scale of one to 10? And that will help your physician and yourself dose adjust as you go. And typically it takes roughly five or six tries to get the right dose for you and where you are in your uh, erectile dysfunction journey. So certainly it's not the type of thing where you're gonna leave the doctor's office and you're gonna have a magic dose that you know exactly where you need to be. There is a little bit of fine tuning along the way. And it, again, it's gonna take five or six tries throughout uh, this process to get to a dose that you're comfortable with and you know works the right amount for you. All right, let me go to the next slide. <clears throat> Preparing for the injection, very good. So first we have some slides. We have the medication vial, we have the needle and the syringe, of course, and then preferably two alcohol prep pods, one for the medication and one for the site of injection. So when we prepare the syringe, and I'll be able to show this in person, uh, we're gonna be removing the cap. We will be uh, pre-dosing uh, our plungers so we don't create a vacuum in the medication. It's important to withdraw the medication with the, with the vial upside down so you're not drawing up air. That's a common mistake that I see is patients will be inserting the needle, drawing the needle back, and they're actually withdrawing air rather than the liquid medication. And it's tough to tell the difference because it's a clear liquid. Uh, and you're going to try to get rid of any bubbles by tapping on the side of the syringe and, and the vial if necessary and trying to get that proper dose. The injection itself, this is a big uh, piece of, of questions that guys often have. We prefer to go at the one to three o'clock if you're right-handed or nine to 11 if you're left-handed. And I do like to mix up sites because one of the other side effects can be some corporal scarring over many administrations on the range of months to years. Uh, but I do try to have my guys to be ambidextrous, but if you're just learning and you're just starting, then I think your best friend is re repetitiveness and practice. So you can go at the same area for the first few times, get comfortable with it, know exactly what it should feel like, where you're going, and make sure you're getting the proper response before you start varying locations, going with the other hand and getting a little bit more advanced. So the injection area should obviously be free of veins on the skin, or else it can lead to some superficial bruising. Not the end of the world, it's just gonna be unsightly and bruised. Uh, then you're gonna gently press the medication into the corporal cavernosal space. One of the biggest issues is getting the needle deep enough, of course, and do this slowly. You know, typically it's one to two seconds for every uh, 10 units. So if you're doing a 40 unit or 0.4 milliliter injection, then that's gonna be, you know, four to eight seconds of an injection. So one swift uh, stab with the needle and a nice, slow, steady injection will probably have the best outcome for you. And then you're gonna remove the needle and hold pressure on that area to prevent any bleeding or bruising. So the side effects, I mentioned a couple of them. Of course, the most worrisome one is priapism or prolonged erection. That means that you gave yourself too good or too high of a dose and uh, your doctor will likely talk about ice packs or Sudafed, but if those don't work, then you're gonna be going to seek medical attention at his or her office or at an urgent care clinic or emergency department. Uh, other side effects in, in the more long term can be scarring or uh, aggravation of a Peyronie's disease if that's present at the beginning. And certainly uh, storage, you don't want that to be an issue. These medications do need to be refrigerated and they do have a shelf life. And so we, the, the beyond use days is technically 28 days from when that was open. So I get this question all the time, can I use my medication beyond the use? And you know the technical answer should be no. So injection accessories, there are some things to help here. So the Insul Tote is a nice little carrying case that you can take on short trips uh, where it has a case for an auto injector, a slot for some syringes, the medication, um, and some alcohol prep pads. There is a gel insulator to keep the medication cool and has an ice pack that you can exchange. And so that's pretty convenient for those who travel or don't live with their partner. Uh, and that's something I do recommend in my everyday practice. The insult ease, I don't use as much. It's basically a, a glorified magnifying glass where if you can't really see the, the numbering on the side of your syringe or you're trying to get the fine tuning, the difference between perhaps uh, 0.45 or 45 units versus 50 units is pretty slim. So if you need a little help seeing the extra space, this insult ease may help. The auto injector is something my patients commonly come asking about. It's basically a spring loaded mechanism to house your syringe and needle where you can hit a button instead of depressing the plunger and it will automatically dispense your medication. 
I'm not a huge fan of auto injectors. I find that they increase the error rate of, of dosing. If you are programmed properly and you have the auto injector set up to the right needle size, the right syringe size, and the right dose, then yes, they can work very well, but there are some technical aspects there that have to be set up for success. And certainly a sharps container, anytime you're using a needle at home, uh, whether for intracavernosal injections or otherwise, uh, you are creating a biohazard and you need to dispose of that properly. Typically, you can take those uh, sharps containers to a local lab or physician's office, or you can call your county um, on where to dispose of that. So uh, more resources, menmd.com slash portal, and you can click on the support tab. There's a number where you can talk to a clinical case manager. They are very active and very helpful. I do refer patients to that line, so they are available for use. Uh, you can also, of course, visit our offices, Clearwater, Palm Harbor, and Barmore. That number is 727-441-1508. We'll be happy to evaluate you. I'm going to gather up my supplies here. First off, we have our medications. This is actually a live medication. You'll have the label, you have the dose. You will have the ingredients listed and the concentrations thereof. So if you're changing physicians uh, and they're not familiar with uh, MedMDs or whatever pharmacy you're using, they can actually see the concentration on the bottle. So that's number one. I'm actually going to be injecting with a, just a trial vial, which is just clear medication. I have some syringes here. Uh, the syringe, again, the most important portions to note are the volume of syringe. I have a 1cc syringe here. The length of the needle, we're going to be using a half inch needle and uh, the gauge or the thickness of the needle, and this will be 29 gauge. And they also make uh, different types of so some providers and some patients prefer a 5 16 inch needle and a 31 gauge, which is a bit smaller needle. I'll show you those in a minute. I have my sharps container to properly dispose of the needles when we are finished. You got two alcohol swabs to prep yourself and the medication, some hand sanitizer or soap, whatever you're gonna use at home to wash your hands prior to initiating. And of course I have our patient here, which we're gonna, uh, change the camera view and I'll be demonstrating on the side. So I promised to talk about the needles for a minute here. So let me show you before I get started with the model, let me show you the difference in size of the needles. So we have two needles here. This is a black surface here. So this needle is uh, the 30, this, excuse me, this is the 31 gauge and this is the 29 gauge. And you'll notice that the 31 gauge is a little bit smaller and shorter and the 29 gauge is a little bit longer and obviously a little bit bigger, but still both considered some of the smallest needles uh, available. These are insulin needles. And I actually do start with the longer needle, uh, especially for my newcomers, because I find that it has less errors uh, in getting that needle deep into the tissue to where it needs to be and administering that medication. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute. So let me cap these up very carefully here and then we'll get started with the, uh, with the model. All right, let me put that down on the side. So when we're talking about where to inject, we mentioned this, the one to three o'clock position is where you're gonna wanna go. So when you're looking at the side, obviously the urethra is on the underside of the penis, and this is gonna be a no landing zone. So the underside is a no landing zone, again, down the middle is for the urethra, and also the very top middle portion is the neurovascular bundle of the penis. That's gonna be a no landing zone. So really we're aiming at the side of the penis from a one to three o'clock position if you were looking at the face of the clock, and we're gonna be entering uh, directly lateral. So if I were to draw this out, I would put a marking at the one o'clock line, approximately here, and the three o'clock line, perhaps here, and that would be our target zone. Let me turn that around for you guys. Somewhere in the one to three o'clock straight lateral position would be our target zone, okay? So let's get ready for our injection. So first you wash your hands. <clears throat> you can do that at home. We have our syringe, we have our medications ready, and we're ready to rock. So medication here. Alcohol swab to clean off the top. Again, you're getting this medication out of the fridge, so this needs to be uh, cold, and that's gonna go back into the fridge when you're done. You're gonna use alcohol swab uh, typically wherever you're injecting. Now, I didn't mention this. I do not like to go in the head of the penis, and I don't like to go too far proximal on the penis. Somewhere along the shaft, pre pre preferably the mid shaft, not too distal, if anything, cheat a little bit proximal, and you're gonna avoid the veins that you can see on the penis. So you're gonna clean off with some alcohol swab there. Let's talk about drawing up the medications. A Couple different ways to do this. I prefer to teach my guys to do it with the vial standing down and then we invert it afterwards. So remove the orange tip, 
you are removing the, the clear uh, butt of the syringe. And then I go ahead and manipulate this to get it primed because these initially can be a little bit sticky. So let's say for this test dose, we're gonna do 30 units or 0.3 milliliters. You draw that up first, you prepare that. I've already cleaned the tip of my medication. I'm stabilizing with my offhand and you, I stab it in and then leave it there. Now you can tip this thing upside down and it'll stay in here, okay? But I do like to stabilize it with two hands. So now that it's upside down, you are injecting. You can see the air bubbles perhaps real slow. So you're getting rid of the vacuum because you're getting ready to withdraw 30 units. And you have to keep care that this stays in line because if I'm angulating, sorry, I'll try to get more on, on track. If I'm angulating the uh, uh, syringe at all, you're gonna bend these very fine needles. So that's a common cause for bent needles is that once it's in, you're, you're changing the angle. You have to go straight in and maintain that straight orientation Withdraw, flick if you need to get rid of the bu air bubbles, and you're set. So important thing is we injected and then we flipped. Some people like to uh, administer from an upside down position. So I say, hold it in your left hand, I'm right hand, this is my right hand. Touch your pinkies, touch your four fingers, and inject this way. And that would be fine because you're already inverted. So whatever way works for you, the, the trick is making sure that you're drawing up the actual medication and not air. All right. So we have our patient here, which would be easier for you guys because you don't, you know, you don't have to hold your penis in place. Uh, you can stabilize it with your offhand. And again, we're going straight into the skin. This is a 90 degree entrance. You do not want to skive the needle along the surface of the skin. And so I'm not going this way. I'm not going up at the base of the penis. Again, we're going towards our target zone that I drew here. And so we're going straight at that 90 degree angle. And remember to avoid the urethra on the underside of the penis and the neurovascular bundle on top. So I think for this purpose, I'll kind of hold it at an oblique angle for you guys. So I'm gonna choose a site here where we cleaned off and I'm gonna kind of stabilize with my pinky and have my index on the syringe. So you're gonna familiar yourself with how this should feel, but you're gonna actually insert the needle all the way to the hub, which is where the metal ends. And what, you can even do this with these longer uh, 29 gauge needles as well. You're gonna insert all the way in one swift motion. So three, two, one, bam, all the way in, hold it there, make a little impression, a little dimple on the skin. You can see how I'm pressing in and then slowly inject. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi. So that took me four seconds for 30 cc. So that's anywhere between one to two seconds per milliliter. And then you're done. When you're done, you need to depress, hold that area of the, the tissue 20, 30 seconds. Make sure you don't get any bruising. You can start stimulating yourself right away. You're not gonna get an erection. Immediately, I tell my guys 10 to 20 minutes before sex, but it does take stimulation. And a lot of patients say that they actually feel the erection before the foreplay starts, and you know that that's working. So that's the way to go. So that is, and then oh, final part, most important, we are disposing of the needle in our sharps container and then getting rid of this uh, properly. So that's the injection in the nutshell, and that's something that we practice. It's not going to be easy on the first time, and it might not be easy on the second time, but uh, if, if you and or your partner can get involved, uh, it takes work, and you can get to a routine that it just becomes part of the evening, and uh, you can get a really good result. So I think that's all I got. Uh, Austin, do we want to dive into the Q&A session here? Yeah, that sounds good with me. Great. All right, first question here. Uh, could it be possible that I've done irreversible damage to the penis from injecting? Irreversible is a strong word, but uh, I suppose the answer is it is possible. The main damage that we were referring to is fibrosis or scar tissue felt de developing on that tunica albuginea layer. And so that's part of the reason why we recommend changing sites of injections and trying not to go in the exact same spot every time. Because the idea is that the microtrauma, even though it's a very fine needle, the microtrauma of the penile uh, injection can cause scar tissue. Uh, there are treatment options for Peyronie's disease. There are treatment options other than injections for erections. So if that's a big concern or you feel like it already has happened, uh, definitely talk to your physician about it. This is something that I tell guys is a risk. It's higher risk in men with already diagnosed Peyronie's disease. And it is more of a long-term risk. So this is typically many months to years after injection therapy. So I do think that injection therapy still plays a role with erectile dysfunction. I do think it's a very effective treatment uh, understanding the limits. All right. Uh, 
Next question. All right. What is the refrigerated shelf life of unopened medication? Of unopened medication. I don't think I've got that question before. Um, whatever is on the package. I know once you open it, this is more commonly asked, once you open it, technical answer is 28 days. Now, the shelf life will have an expiration on the bottle, so I'd have to refer you to that bottle. Um, this one has a best if used by label on it, and it has a, a date on the bottle. So if it's unopened, I would say refer to the date on your, on your dispensing uh, prescription. Right. Uh, what percentage of men who start injection therapy drop out after a time of pain? Uh, good question. Most men who drop out of therapy will do so fairly early after the first one or two injections. In my practice, I found that that number is fairly low because we have already received a test dose injection in the clinic. So they're familiar with what the needle feels like. They're familiar with what the medication response is. So I like to think that my my dropout rate is fairly low, probably 20 percent, 15 percent. That might be a little bit optimistic. Um, but once you get home, and if it's not for you, there are treatment options other than injections to discuss, and that's why I'm always talking to my patients about this is a solution that will work for you, but if it doesn't work for your life or your wife or your partner, then we need to explore other options. So hard to put an exact percentage on that because it's probably variable between practices. All right, uh, next question here. Are ICI injections more effective than intraurethral gels? I would argue yes. So this is uh, intraurethral gels and pellets. Uh, gels refers to MUSE therapy. They're essentially the same medications, but without the needle. And it does have a dispenser to go down the pee hole, down the urethra. And I would argue that injecting directly into the corporal cavernosal space, uh, administering the medication directly to the tissues rather than asking it to be absorbed through the mucosal layers of the urethra is more effective. And I think that the literature has showed the rate of, of privism and prolonged erection certainly higher with ICI, but also the rate of success, meaning partner satisfaction and patient satisfaction also higher with ICI. Okay, uh, next question here. I'm afraid of bleeding because there are so many veins. What happens if I accidentally hit a vein? Uh, great question. And, and I get this a lot, especially with patients on blood thinners. Um, they're on a uh, baby aspirin, full dose aspirin. They're on full dose blood thinners, Plavix, Warfarin, Coumadin. Uh, you can still administer these types of injections with uh, these types of conditions. It's just you have to take a little bit extra care and it's more common that these patients will bruise. The superficial veins underneath the skin of the penis uh, are not going to make you bleed out or become anemic, but it will become unsightly bruise or hickey appearance on the side of your penis. The way to avoid that is to try to carefully look at the area, see where the veins are and avoid them, and then holding pressure. And if, for those of you on blood thinners or who have had bruising in the past, hold it for a good minute to three minutes and apply pressure to that area. Typically when you inject the medication, the needle's so small, it will either skive the vein or go through and through the vein, and that's what causes the bleeding. So it's not like you're administering the medication directly into a venous space, but you are disrupting that vein and you're gonna cause some superficial bleeding and that can be fairly bothersome. So my recommendation is to, is to hold pressure afterwards and try to select your site carefully. All right, uh, next question here. It's starting to become painful to inject. Is there another medication I can use without injecting? Yeah, and, and I do hear this. Uh, men who are on intracavernosal injections for a long period of time, half a year, 18 months, etc., uh, they do tire from using the medications, whether it's because they just get tired of the needles or they get soreness over time, or some people lose efficacy, they lose effectiveness of the drug. And in those cases, uh, really we're talking about uh, vacuum erection devices, perhaps an intraurethral agent such as Muse uh, or, or gel, intraurethral gel, or we're talking about a penile implant procedure to restore those erections. So there are other options. It's difficult if a patient is on a high dose injection. There's not a lot of things on the market that are as strong as a high dose injection. And that's when we're talking more about surgical options. Uh, but that certainly depends on the patient preferences and, and his or her, uh, his cause of erections. All right. Uh, the last time I injected the syringe split, I now have a hard cyst under the skin. 
on the side of my penis, should I worry? Uh, a hard cyst. Hmm. I've, I've had some patients who inject and they get the needle underneath the skin and not into the corporal cavernosal space and then they inject and you're now basically have a bubble or a bleb of medication that is subcutaneous and not within the deep tissues of the penis. So obviously it's in the wrong spot. It's not the end of the world, but having a hard cyst is, is what is interesting about this particular question. Um, you know, it, it, a very small risk of infection whenever you inject anything into the skin. So I wonder if there's an infection associated with this bleb of medication. I would typically tell my patient that if you do inject underneath the skin, you'll feel a wheel or a bubble there, but it will self-absorb over time and it's not gonna cause you problems. But if it's been there for a long time, meaning over a few days and it's becoming hard, then I would definitely want to examine that patient or, or have him go back to his treating physician. All right. Is it safe to mix injection medication in oral meds like Viagra or Cialis? To take, so the question is, can I take my PDE5 inhibitor like Viagra Cialis and inject? Uh, and I commonly prescribe these types of regimens in the right patient. I use both uh, daily Tadalafil, low-dose uh, Cialis, and injections. And in occasional cases, a little bit more rare, uh, I will use an on-demand dose of Viagra in addition to injection. I got to admit, I don't do that very frequently, but it is common for me to do a low-dose daily pill in addition to injections. And, and I would say that's, that's safe, absolutely. All right. Uh, I use an injection device. And I don't feel like it went all the way in. Does the needle go far enough into the muscle? Am I doing something wrong? They're using an auto injector. Was that the question? Yeah. Okay. So uh, with the auto injectors, you have to set it up properly for the syringe size, the needle length, and the administering dose. And so all three of those parameters have to be met. If you're using the wrong needle or the wrong setting on the auto injector, then it will shortchange you with how deep it injects. Uh, again, it's not a risk to your health if the medication doesn't go deep enough. It's just not going to be effective, of course, uh, which is frustrating. So when you use an auto injector, you have to work with your prescriber to make sure that all of the settings are proper and that the needle is getting deep enough to where it needs to go and that you have the proper plunge mechanism of that syringe. Uh, part of the reason I don't use them as much because it's just it's an extra element, many elements, I would argue, for error. And I find that unless the patient really has neuromuscular issues or, or dexterity control issues, uh, that they're better off just using the, the syringe itself. Okay. Uh, how long should an erection last using injection medication? Good question. And this is, everyone has different expectations when they come in asking about this or we're prescribing it. This is patient dependent. I would like the erection to last as long as it takes for a good session of sex. And that, of course, is different for every couple. Uh, or if you're masturbating, I want you to be able to masturbate uh, to your pleasure. And then, of course, the most important thing is that the erection subsides. So that textbook cutoff is four hours. I don't want an erection lasting anywhere near four hours. I would prefer for a good session of sex, most men, they need less than an hour. So I would like a good 30 to 60 minutes of a healthy erection that is there and then will begin to subside because by the time this erection lasts two and a half, three, three and a half hours, the patient is getting nervous and that's an anxiety that should not be associated with the pleasurable act of sex. So in the real world, it's you know anywhere from 30 to 60 to 90 minutes. That's still safe. That's probably enough time for you to have as much fun as you need during that session. Uh, but you certainly don't want to approach that four hour mark because you can get irreversible, long lasting damage to the penile tissues and you need to seek medical attention. So you don't want to have to think about going to the emergency room when you're, when you're trying to, uh, to enjoy yourself. So shorter uh, than an hour is probably the average, uh, but a good 20 to 60 minutes is perfectly acceptable. All right, next question here. I am right-handed and have a difficult time injecting the left side of the penis. Do you have any tips for that? I have an auto injector. That's a that's a tough one. Maybe easier with the auto injector in this circumstance. Uh, a right-handed individual, it's like learning to, to brush your teeth with your off hand. It's very hard. 
Uh, so an auto injector may help. What I would do instead of the, I guess my tip here, here, instead of uh, holding it right handed and then trying to flip over and use the right hand to administer, see what you can do with your left hand to stabilize the needle, stabilize the auto injector and do a true left handed stab. And it's gonna feel funny, it's gonna be weird, it's gonna take practice, but most of the time it's easier to be ambidextrous and use the left hand to approach the left side of the penis rather than asking your left hand to bend over the penis and hold it reverse. And that's awkward and often leads to error. So if someone is mixing up injection sites, both right and left, I try to have them do a true right-handed approach and a true left-handed approach. Maybe easier with an auto injector in this situation, uh, but that's that would be my recommendation. All right, I have another question kind of around that same area. Would injecting both sides of the penis make a difference? I think we talked about that. <clears throat> uh, is, I get, maybe this question is referring to, should I split my dose and inject half in one and half in the other? Because I've had that question okay. before. And the answer, I, I don't really encourage that. The septum of the penis that divides the right and left sides is actually perforated. So any in medication or injection that goes into the right side is going to make it to the left side of the penis. So I say for each uh, injection, for each session, just pick a side and do one side. Now, over time, if you're mixing up site locations, then yes, uh, for those who are comfortable with injections, I do advocate picking different sites along the left and right sides so you get a bilateral approach over time and you're spacing out those injections a little bit more and you're not going in the same exact point every time. So that the idea is that you're you're spreading out the micro trauma of the needle injection. All right, next question here. When I get my medication, should I freeze it or refrigerate it? Which one's better? Definitely refrigerate it. Um, I have had patients freeze it. It can still work. They don't recommend it. The, the pharmacists and formulations don't recommend it. Uh, it will turn your solution cloudy. And I tell patients that a cloudy solution is oftentimes the first alert that you get for a, an expired or contaminated medication. So I do not like my patients to freeze it. I prefer that it stays in the fridge and that we adhere to the 28 days because this, you know, this is your health. And I wouldn't recommend anyone using expired insulin or or contaminated needles or reused needles. So this is something that the problems that go along with a contaminated solution or uh, an improperly mixed or stored solution, the problems that go along with that are probably worse than, than the inconvenience of storing it properly and getting new, new medication. All right. If scar tissue does occur at the injection site, can it be treated and or removed? <clears throat> The answer is yes, although it's difficult and it depends on exactly what that scar tissue is causing. What, what kind of problems is it causing? Is it causing a, a curvature or a deformity of the penis? Perhaps it's causing a bottleneck deformity. Um, it depends on exactly what's going on. There are treatments to straighten the penis, and these are, of course, surgical treatments. And there are treatments that you can inject in that area if you have a very firm plaque, such as Zyaflex injections, which would be a local treatment to that plaque or scar tissue that can try to break up the plaque. Uh, and there are even more advanced techniques where you can excise that plaque. I, that's a very involved procedure that I do enjoy, but it's only for the properly selected patient. Uh, so the answer is yes, there are treatment options, both surgical and non-surgical. And uh, it would be very dependent upon the characteristics of the plaque, where it's located, and what deformity or what issues is that plaque causing. All right, next question here. I've effectively used Trimix 60 days past expiration date by refrigerating it. How much past expiration is it safe to use medication? <laughs> I'm not sure anyone really knows that, uh, that answer. How long? can you get out of one vial? Um, the reason that they put the 28 day expiration date on, and I've talked to the, the MedMD team, is that during the formulation process, while it's in the lab, in the compounding lab, they everything is sterile. The components, the drugs, the glass casing, the people working it are wearing sterile suits, and the air is de-dusted. So it's a, a perfectly sterile environment so that when it arrives to your door and it has this little metal tab on it, Everything about this 
contained medication is sterile. Once you peel off the tab and start using it, you've now started the time clock. And studies have shown that after 28 days of being open to the outside world, your risk of contamination and also of uh, drug effectiveness goes unacceptably high. So, you know, it's, it's good that you had a good effect when you used your medication 60 days out. I don't know how much I can recommend you milk that same bottle for. To be honest, it's not as though old medication will cause complications or hurt you. Most commonly, it will just be ineffective. But if you inject with a contaminated substance, now that's a serious problem and it's not risk the antibiotics and the hassle you have to go for treatment. So uh, take that with a grain of salt, I suppose. All right, can long-term injection cause scar tissue? Long-term injection of, of intracavernosal injections, I, uh, yes. Yes, that's one of the side effects uh, over time, particularly if you're going in the same area. Uh, repetitive injections to the same site, to that focal trauma of the tunic albuginea layer of the penis, it can cause scar tissue. And that's something that uh, we talk about. And, and there's, you need to plan out exactly what your goals are with treatment. How long do we anticipate needing treatment? Is there any history of Peyronie's disease or pre-existing scar tissue in the penis? Very commonly goes hand in hand with erectile dysfunction. And is this the best treatment for that patient? So in short, the answer is yes. I do think it's a very acceptable risk. Uh, I think this is something that most patients want to know about. Uh, and it's not something that we commonly see. So I don't want to overinflate the problem, uh, but it, it is a, a minimal risk. All right. Even with proper dosage, my erection lessens during sex. Getting up and walking around helps me regain my erection. Why does this happen? Common scenario that you inject, let's say you change position, you get up or you lay down, whatever, uh, and then the erection will fade and then come back when you assume the other position. This is a pretty good indication of a venous leak. So most all these medications on the market target the arterial inflow to the penis. They're, they're trying to increase that arterial inflow, the, the smooth muscle dilation, they're allowing the penis to engorge, but the veins are not targeted. So if that veins are still open, they're allowing the blood flow to come back to the main body circulation and you're not maintaining that rigid erection. So that's commonly what happens when you change positions. Uh, they'll say, doc, I had a great erection, but then I laid down and the erection just faded. Or opposite, like I stood up and we were changing position and the erection just boom, gone. That's a pretty good indication for venous leak. Uh, there are limited treatment options for venous leak. Most commonly prescribed are constriction bands, a glorified cock ring. So constriction bands are medical devices that will essentially uh, perform a tourniquet at the base of the penis, compress those veins, and stop that venous return to the body. And uh, if you combine that with an intracavernosal injection, you can have great success in those situations. Um, I do use constriction vans and vacuum erection devices regularly in my practice, uh, patient dependent again, but in the right patient, you can have that side effect of losing the erection. You can definitely minimize on that, and it's likely because of uh, venous leak. All right, next question here. Do you recommend a penile implant for a patient who isn't fully responding to injections? Absolutely. That speaks near and dear to my heart. I'm glad whoever asked that. Thank you. Uh, so. Penile implant surgery or procedure is really the, the, the gold standard of, of treatment options in that it provides a mechanical mechanism for the penis to get erect. And you're restoring the natural function of the penis to get hard when you want it to get hard and go soft when it, the rest of the day when you don't want to have sex. And that is really the most reliable and most spontaneous treatment options out there. And those two factors alone make it the highest rated satisfaction between both the partner and the patient. So yes, I would recommend penile implant surgery. That's something I routinely talk to patients about. Even before talking about um, injection therapy, I lay out all the options with my patient. I talk about pills, uh, vacuum devices, intraurethral agents, injections, and I'll also include in that discussion inflatable penile prosthesis. And it's up to, to me and that patient to make a decision on which one fits their lifestyle best. And uh, certainly penile implant surgery is, is perhaps the most invasive because you have to go to the operating room. But in reality, it's an hour or less procedure. 
it's a minimal recovery time. And if you can get through the procedure and get through that healing time, you're going to be off to the races and having the best sex of your life uh, four to six weeks later. So th that is certainly a treatment option I would recommend for someone who's having frustration with needles, uh, who is not having the desired outcome despite proper administration. I would explore penile implant surgery. Absolutely. All right. A solid lump is formed underneath the skin. Do you know how this may have happened? Is it permanent and or dangerous? The question was, a solid lump has formed under the skin? Yes. Okay. Underneath the skin. <clears throat> okay. It's probably from repetitive uh, injections in the same area. It's probably some element of scar tissue. Perhaps at one point, they, uh, this patient had a, a bleed, meaning a little superficial bruising, and the blood got congealed in that area and can harden and can take a long time for a hardened clot, essentially, to get reabsorbed by the body. That could be going on. Without any sort of redness or pain, I would have less suspicion for infection. Uh, so my two you know, differential diagnosis at this point would be, you know, like a hematoma that is organized in a blood clot, essentially, or scar tissue. And I wouldn't necessarily say it's dangerous by any means, but I would recommend trying to change the injection site away from that area. Okay. Uh, I've been using Trimix for four months with good results, but I'm having trouble having an orgasm. What can I do to help me reach orgasm? Nice question. These are good. Uh, so I put erection quality in a separate category than orgasm, in a separate category than ejaculation. I think those those are all three obviously related events, but the physiology behind those three are different. The physiology behind erection and reaching climax and a forward ejaculatory outcome, uh, those are all three separate events. So they're not just because you have one or two doesn't mean you're going to have the third one. So this person is injecting and having difficulty reaching orgasm. There are treatment options out there. Um, there are medications that you can try orally, um, and there are sexual therapies that you can try as well. I typically start with, um, with medications like cabergoline or oxytocin. These are commonly used to help a man reach climax. And we're not talking about ejaculation, I'm talking about climax. Usually they go hand in hand. Uh, but those are the first two medications I would start with. After that, it becomes a little bit more difficult to treat medically. Uh, as a third line and not as successful, I have tried some topical creams in a few patients that has worked pretty well. And I also talk about uh, referral to a sexual therapist because now we're getting into what excites the patient most, what works best in terms of sexual acts. And that's something that often can be hashed out with a sexual therapist to optimize uh, the, the patient partner relationship. So we do have treatment options as the answer. Uh, there are medications and pills that can often help. And that's something that uh, your, your sexual expert or treatment physician would have to provide. Good question. All right. If you, if you use a constriction ring, uh, do you tighten it before or after the injection? <clears throat> Good question. Most constriction rings are a gel, almost like a rubber band but they're medical grade, they're thicker than a rubber band, and they're easier to apply on and off. And they usually have little, little handles on the side. I don't have a model here, I'll show you. Uh, so it, essentially it's a, an elastic, it's a rubber band, but think of an elastic band that's a one size fit all. And uh, if you're using it in combination with a vacuum device, you usually create the vacuum on the penis and then slide the constriction band to the base of the penis. Or without, you're using the injection, you're getting some rigidity, and then you put the constriction band on the side. So you don't have to strap it in or tighten it down or click it to the right like belt buckle hole. It's a one size fit all apparatus. They're usually uh, like a silicone elastic rubber material. And uh, they do have handles on the side to make it easier to take on and off. One big thing about uh, constriction bands, I always tell all my patients, do not fall asleep in the constriction band. If you have a great session of sex, take it off before you fall asleep afterwards. Uh, you do not want to be the guy who wakes up 12 hours later and has been wearing a tourniquet on his penis overnight. That, that's uh, not a good situation. So make sure you take off the band when you're done with sex. And uh, it, it's a one size fit all typically. And they are they do make different sizes. So when I say one size fit all, I mean that you don't have to adjust the band. You just have to have the proper fitting band. 
All right, does emotional state impact the success of injection therapy? I'd say absolutely. My personal experience in, in treating patients with this is those who have an involved partner have the highest satisfaction rates. So a partner who understands that you have to excuse yourself and go to the fridge and inject, who understands that there's an element of foreplay and is involved in treatments. I've had patients incorporate the injection into foreplay and I find that fun. Uh, so patients who do that together and are treating erectile dysfunction with their partner uh, often have the most success. Now, certainly treat a number of single guys out there and you can absolutely do this discreetly uh, when played properly. So you just, you have to excuse yourself, go to the fridge and inject. Some men have this, this vial sterilely and properly drawn up, has the medication artery already in it. They go to their partner's house with it in their little tote bag. And that way, when it comes time uh, for sex, they just go to the bathroom and inject. There's no refrigerator run. There's no going downstairs. You just step aside for a minute, inject, you come back, and that medication's in your system and running. All of this wraps into the emotional state. Emotional state's a big part of the erection process. If you are stressed or tired or your mind is elsewhere, you're not going to have a good erection, period. Uh, the, the neurotransmitters required from the brain and the signaling that goes to the penis is certainly disrupted when you have high levels of stress hormones running around your body, when you have other things on your mind, and when you can't get to that erotic state of mind, that will affect uh, your erections. If there are relationship stresses, financial stresses, work stresses, coronavirus stresses, that can affect patients' sex lives, and I see it every day, and that's something that uh, we try to talk through and can be very difficult. So that's often, that's, yes, is the answer. Emotional state, very important when it comes to sexual activity. Great. Uh, for post prostatectomy rehab, is a VED sufficient, or do you think injections are far better if sex or erections per se are not wanted? <clears throat> Depends who you ask. So the topic is post vasectomy, excuse me, post prostatectomy penile rehab, and this is kind of a hot topic in the in the sexual medicine realms. Everyone that you ask will have a slightly different regimen. Uh, I think universally, everyone uses some level of pills, whether it be daily or regular use of on-demand dosing. I prefer daily uh, Cialis and then on-demand dosing. I do like a vacuum erection device. I think that absolutely plays a role. And in most patients who are willing, I do advocate its use even before surgery. So I like to get a penile prehab started before they go into their prostate surgery. Uh, after surgery, I do usually use uh, oral pills and vacuum devices, and I like to see how they get, depending on what surgery they had. If they had a nerve sparing surgery, then my hopes are higher that we can restore erections, uh, typically within that six to 12 timeline, and we can get back, not necessarily to where they were preoperatively, but to a satisfactory point. It also depends on where they started going into surgery, to be honest. One of the biggest factors is what were your erections like before prostate surgery, and that will play on how your erections come out after surgery. For the patient that wants to do more than just pills and injections, uh, some people advocate muse or intraurethral gels and agents, and some other uh, physicians will regularly prescribe intracavernosal injections. I don't commonly use intracavernosal injections for routine rehabilitation, I would prefer to reserve it for sexual activity or masturbation. Uh, I think that the, the trauma involved in the needles and the hassle of getting the needle in, I just it's a little bit uh, involved for a patient who's just trying to restore the best blood flow to the penis. Because to be honest, I think that the PD-5s and the vacuum are creating that blood flow to the penis. I understand the patient might not keep the erection, but the goal of the rehab is to bring that healthy, fresh, oxygenated blood to these tissues that weren't receiving it prior. And to have to do a needle for that is a little bit much. Um, I, I have done it with some patients at their request, and, and I don't have a big problem with doing it, but it's not something I routinely uh, do in terms of rehabilitation alone. I do very commonly prescribe injection therapy for patients that have had their prostate removed because oftentimes pills don't cut it, uh, and they're not getting the erection they want with more conservative treatment options, and thus I have no issues going to injections and discussing injections in that patient so they can get the erections they want for sexual activity. All right, what are the chances of exposing and or being exposed to STIs or STDs due to 
uh, injection site bleeding? Typically minimal, but not zero. It's a good question. I don't know of any studies that have actually given me a percentage of what risk you are in, in encountering because you are having a small needle poke into the skin. I don't know of any studies that quote that risk. I would say if there is any question whatsoever to absolutely use a condom, use protection and avoid the issue. Uh, typically, you know, if, if it's a monogamous couple, a married couple, it's not an issue. Uh, but if there is any question, just use protection because I think that there likely is a small risk of, uh, or a higher risk of contracting an STD. But to be honest, whether or not you gave yourself a small needle stick, I don't think that's going to be the difference in contracting an STI or not. If your partner has the STI, the difference between you using a needle or not using a needle, the risk is too great. You need to be using protection. So not the difference maker in the risk. All right. How do you store the medicine when traveling out of state? How long will the medication last without icing? Uh, good question. You know, that I would recommend some insul tote or some sort of carrier to uh, to contain your medication. Typically for short plane rides, if you don't open the package, you, you put the, the ice pack, it's a gel ice pack in there, you put your medication bottle next to it, you keep it closed. I've had some patients wrap it with other blankets or even put it inside a, a larger lunch bag cooler. And they've gone cross country, Florida to California, no problem. Um, for longer flights, international flights, I'd, I'd recommend the same thing and hope that it stays cool. Uh, you know, again, I don't think if at the worst that happens if the medication does not stay cool uh, is that it will be ineffective. You haven't opened the medication or necessarily affected its sterility, but you just might not get the effect you want. So I don't have a timeline because it depends on how cold your environment is and how cold your ice pack was. There's too many variables to predict that. But keeping a cold on an ice pack is usually sufficient, certainly for, for day trips. Um, usually everyone has no issues when they get there. And, you know, as soon as you land or as soon as you get to your house or your partner's house, put it in the fridge and that's usually not a problem. All right, next question here. Is there a relationship to erection size and the amount of trimix that you need to use? In other words, do larger organs need more medication? Good question. No, I do not think that's true. Um, I've had men with penis sizes all over the map. And more important than penis size is the physiology and the cause of erectile dysfunction. The nature of erectile dysfunction and what kind of erection, what quality of erections the patient can get on their own are probably more important than, than anatomy and size. So the little bit of medication that your doctor may prescribe, 20 units, it looks really small in the syringe. Even if you have a big penis, it's gonna cascade the proper response throughout your tissues. And uh, I would not recommend increasing your dose just because you're well endowed, but I don't think that there's a direct correlation between size and necessary dose. I think more, much more of a correlation would be uh, cause of erections, and the erection quality pre-treatment. All right. Uh, can you become progressively tolerant to the medication so that you need a different formula down the road or higher dosage? Yes. And this is pretty true with all sorts of erectile dysfunction medication, whether it's pills, et cetera. Uh, most patients over time develop a, a tolerance, if you will, where the effectiveness of the medication declines. And I'm not so sure that it's necessarily uh, the medication effectiveness dropping or the patient's comorbidities and, side of, and uh, health going the wrong direction. So over time, patients lose uh, th their diabetes, the high blood pressure, the cause of their erection function is still there. It hasn't gone away. So the chronic nature of diabetes, for example, will only increase over time. And even if it's well-maintained, it can still have its effect on the penile tissue. So it's probably a mix of both the patient's health and comorbidities, as well as the tolerance, so to speak, of the medications. It's not uncommon to hear that, you know, doc, I used to get great erections with 20 units of Trimix number five. I used it a few times and now I'm just not getting the response I wanted. And that's when we kind of creep up the ladder of different doses. We talk about dose escalation versus changing the formulation. So both dose and formula go into that. 
and I do see that very commonly over time. At the at the end of the road, we have to talk about getting off of injections. Now, this is a variable timeline. Some people advance through this very quickly on the range of years, some people on the range of decades. So everyone's a little bit different with how long the medication will be good for. Uh, most guys, you know, it's on the range of many years to, to decades. So if you can give someone good erectile function, five, 10, 20 years, that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> All right, can you inject more than once within 24 hours for those special occasions? That's a busy weekend. No, I, I typically try not to within the same 24 hour period. Um, I prefer one injection for 24 hours max, try to limit it to three to four injections a week. And uh, it, and it's a dual thing. You know, you're, you wanna, number one, fight that process where you get tolerant to the medication. You wanna fight the process of penile trauma in a repetitive nature. And spacing it out a little bit allows the body to reset and you're avoiding that repetitive trauma. So most physicians will recommend one injection per 24 hours and preferably three to four injections a week. And that's that's enough for most people. For special occasions, are, are you going to uh, you know, hurt yourself by injecting Friday, Saturday, Sunday? No, but I would limit it once in 24 hours. I think that should be a, a pretty firm rule. All right, we are officially over the seven o'clock time frame, but we've got uh, you know, two more questions if you want to go forward. With that. Yeah, these have been good. Let's let's do a couple more. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, are the injections covered under insurance? Typically, no. Uh, most commonly, these come from compounding pharmacies. Uh, MenMD is a compounding pharmacy. Uh, some VA patients can get like a Bimix or even just a straight EDEX, which is Alprostadil. Uh, most of my patients that I'm seeing know their insurance companies do not cover it. And uh, many insurance companies don't even cover pills. So it's just variable between the insurance companies. Uh, most do not. Interestingly, insurance companies do typically cover penile implants. Medicare covers penile implants, but Medicare will not cover injection therapy. So uh, it depends on the individual insurer, and it depends on obviously the, the prescribed uh, medication for treatment. But but typically, no insurance does not cover injections. But they're not very expensive. You can uh, less than $150 per vial. Do you know Austin the exact cost? I think it's on the range of $75 to $150 a vial. Let me have that somewhere. I don't know what the cost is off the top of my head. Yeah, I know it's not, uh, I don't have it on this sheet that I have. It's not break the bank. Um, if I recall, it's somewhere in that 75 to 150 range, so you're paying cash, uh, but it's, it's not too exorbitant, exorbitant. All right, how do I overcome being so uncomfortable giving myself an injection? Great question. I think uh, practice and if you can do it in a controlled environment, perhaps without the pressure of having to perform sexually afterwards, maybe you can do it quietly, home alone, test dose inject yourself and simply masturbate afterwards. That would probably take the pressure of the performance anxiety element out of it and you wouldn't be rushed to be ready at a certain time. Um, and lining up the needle is probably the most important factor when you're about to inject. So choosing a site, number one, and then getting the proper orientation where you're going in at a 90 degree angle. You're not angling at a 45 and you're not skiving the skin. You're going straight into that surface of the penis. Uh, and once you make that decision, just commit. Hub the needle all the way in, get it done with, slowly inject the medication, pull out and apply pressure. And if you can do that in a controlled environment without the stress of or the excitement of having sex, uh, that would probably be a good way to practice and to start. And just with the understanding that this is a, a treatment option that's going to take a little bit of time to get comfortable to. I mean, you are putting a small needle into your penis. It, it, it's going to take some practice. And it's something that uh, men routinely do. And you can do it, too, with the proper practice and uh, familiarity with your own anatomy and how you can best hold the needle, approach the penis, where to inject, etc. So you can get there. It just needs to practice. All right, next question here. I only get a semi-hard erection. Why do I not get a full erection from the injection? One of two questions. Uh, is it the proper dose and is it the proper formulation? Um, and it's probably just a matter of trial and error. It's encouraging to hear that you are getting somewhat of a response and I'm also hearing that it's not 
a satisfactory response. So there's a lot of room for improvement. So I would ask uh, you to return to your treatment physician and talk about the dose. Can you escalate? Now, when I write a prescription, I typically write it for a low dose, 10 to 20 units, with permission for the patient to increase that dose to a set maximum, somewhere 40 to 60 units, depending what we're writing for. And I ask the patient to keep that erection log. So they know, and it's sometimes difficult to remember if you're only having sex once a week, once a month, whatever, it's difficult to remember exactly what you injected and what your response was. So if you have it written down somewhere and you are preparing for the weekend festivities and you know that last time you injected 20 units and you got a four out of 10 response and it didn't last nearly as long as you wanted, you'd probably be safe to go up 10 units, inject a little bit more at your next time and see if that gets you to the where you want. You got to go up in small increments. It is a trial and error. The secret is landing in that good seven to nine range. You don't need to have a rock hard rigid direction. I don't want you in the prolonged direction category, but using that trial and error and slow increment up. Uh, and it's really a dose titration, a fancy word for you have to try it and see what works best for you. And so this is at an active process between the patient uh, and the doctor, as well as the partner to find the right dose. And it usually does take half a dozen tries to get that right dose. So, uh, you know, the reason behind why, why not getting it probably comes down to, if you've administered it correctly, it probably comes down to dose and, and formulation. All right, and we'll make this the last question here. Uh, what are the long-term effects and do you have any advice to minimize adverse effects? <clears throat> the the long-term effects we've, we've talked about pretty well uh, throughout the last hour or so. Long-term effects, everyone is worried about the scar tissue formation and uh, possibly developing fibrosis or Peyronie's disease or penile curvature or a nodule where you inject. And so we, we optimize or try to limit that risk by altering injection sites, both right and left, proximal, distal, et cetera, keeping in mind the parameters and the borders of where you're allowed to inject. Uh, the short-term risks are the prolonged erection and the priapism. And, uh, you know, those are, are real risks, but I think acceptable risk to, to give that patient and the partner the erectile response that's desired. And so this is certainly an effective treatment uh, and the properly selected patient and the patient who understands how to use the, uh, the injection and how to properly dose themselves. All right, thank you for that. I uh, just wanna let everyone know, we had a lot of questions submitted to this event and unfortunately we were unable to get to all of them during this time. Uh, we'll, we'll work on getting uh, the remainder of the questions answered as soon as possible and share those with the group um, once we do. Uh, so just so everyone knows, we only got through like a third of the questions that we had submitted. So hang, <laughs> so hang tight, it. everybody. We'll, we'll try to get your questions answered. We'll, we'll um, have to figure out a way to do that. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, with that, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Balin for taking his time. Uh, to present today, and we'd also like to thank everyone listening in uh, for attending this MinMD Real Talk webinar. Uh, we hope it was informative, and you'll join us again in the future. If you'd like to learn more about injection therapy, we have a few options for you. Uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, we've attached the injection therapy guide uh, to this event. If you'd like, you may download the PDF for your reference later. Uh, that will be in the handout tab on the control panel. Uh, there are also more resources in the resource center on minimd.com. Uh, visit this page to view instructional videos, guides, expert articles, and much more. Uh, you can also call MinMD at 857-233-5837 or log into the Password Protected Secure MinMD portal to schedule an appointment with uh, one of our clinical case managers. Uh, and then finally, if you're interested in injection accessories, you can learn more or purchase accessories on the shop page in the MinMD portal. We'll also be sending a follow-up email with references to helpful resources and links to each after the event. Um, but with that, I'd like to thank everyone again for attending today's webinar, and we will see you at the next one. Sounds good. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.